When Mika Hakkinen made his F1 debut in 1991, it was with the iconic Team Lotus. The team, however, were just a shadow of their former self and on a steep decline after the departure of the starman Ayrton Senna back in late 1987. Even the recruitment of world champion Nelson Piquet for 1988 and Honda engines couldn't keep the team from slipping back down the order. After a few really dismal seasons, the team recruited some new young talent to try and invigorate the outfit like Senna did when he joined in 1985. Q British F3 champion Mika Hakkinen. The young Finn had dominated in F3 and was on course to win the end of season Macau F3 race as well until he came across a certain Michael Schumacher. Still, this was enough for Team Lotus to give Hakkinen his big break in 1991. Spark now have made a 118th version of the Lotus 102B that Mika drove at the Monaco Grand Prix of that year, and here it is, so let's have an in-depth look at it. And Hakkinen is out of the cockpit, so hopefully he is quite okay, and it looks to me as though there's been a pass. Mika Hakkinen's debut F1 season was a tough one. His Team Lotus were not the same outfit anymore that dominated F1 back in the 60s and 70s. The car he made his debut with, the Lotus 102B, was the same as the year before, only now it had a Judd V8 engine instead of the Lamborghini V12. Gone too was the money from Camel, so the team was beginning to struggle financially as well. Mika, however, despite being a rookie, did a good job at the start of the year. He qualified in the midfield on his debut in Phoenix and ran well until, weirdly enough, he had his steering wheel coming off. He eventually recovered from that scare, but in the end he retired after all with engine issues. He at least managed to qualify the car, whereas his teammate Julian Bailey failed to do so for three of the first four races. At the third run in Imola, Mika scored his first points by finishing an excellent fifth. His teammate Bailey finished behind him in 6th to score Lotus's only point of the season. After the 4th round, Bailey got dropped in favour of Johnny Herbert. Here was a teammate Mika could really measure his worth with, but both drivers struggled through the rest of the season in the aging 102B. Lotus was happy with his drivers though and kept the same lineup for the 1992 season. Although they started out the year again with the same old chassis, but now powered by Ford, the team introduced a new 107 at the Monaco Grand Prix. This much improved car finally allowed both drivers to showcase their talents. Mika led the way, scoring most of Lotus's points that year. These performances caught the eye of Ron Dennis and eventually earned him a place as a McLaren test and reserve driver for 1993. The rest is of course well documented. When Andretti bailed out of F1 after the Italian Grand Prix, Hakkinen would get his chance in the McLaren. He promptly outqualified his teammate Senna at his first attempt and would go on to score his maiden podium at the next race in Japan. After Senna left the team to join Williams in 1994, Mika became the de facto team leader. McLaren however struggled with a new Peugeot engine and Hakkinen tried to make up for the car's deficit by overdriving it. He had plenty of retirements and clashes, which even earned him a race ban. The 1995 season was more of the same, with McLaren partnering up again with a new engine manufacturer, now Mercedes. The chassis was also pretty dismal that year, and Mika had another character-building season. He did improve his driving a lot at the tail end of the year, but a huge crash during the last race weekend at Adelaide put a stop to his progress. This was a pretty severe accident, and actually Mika was even lucky to survive it. He recovered miraculously well and didn't even miss the season's opener in 1996. He then had to wait another year to finally score his first win at the 97 season finale at Jerez. He could have won more races that season, but he was often let down by his car not being reliable at the opportune moments. That first win, however, opened the floodgates though, and he started 1998 with a win again and went on to dominate the first part of the season. Ferrari and Michael Schumacher put up a good fight, but in the end Mika was finally crowned champion in 1998. He went on to repeat it in 1999 and came very close again in 2000, having a fierce battle with Ferrari's Michael Schumacher once again. Mika called time on his F1 career at the end of 2001. He actually took a sabbatical, having never really formally announced his F1 retirement. He did race on in the DTM for Mercedes later on, and to this day he is still an ambassador for McLaren. Spark announced a 118th version of Hakkinen's Lotus 102B a while ago already. This car has never been produced in scale 118th before, so it's pretty cool to see one actually being made now. 
With Mika being a popular figure still, I think a lot of collectors were waiting for a car from his debut season. Strangely enough, Spark decided to make a Monaco Grand Prix version and not a USA Grand Prix one, the race in which Mika made his F1 debut. He also scored his first points at the San Marino Grand Prix, so that also would have been a more obvious choice to base the model on. I can't see any reason as to why they decided on the Monaco Grand Prix, as he barely qualified for the race and had to retire from it with an oil leak. There is no way to make this model into a USA Grand Prix version either, as it had a very different engine cover shape that race. But okay, it doesn't really matter too much. As I said, it's nice to have a model from his debut season available now. The model comes in the standard packaging Spark 118th models are released in nowadays. So the box is just the regular dog grey Spark branded box, with just one window here at the front. Inside is a display case that is tightly wrapped with these protective foam pieces. This band here explains how to remove these foam pieces, and then also acts as a handle to lift it out of the box. The display case provided is well protected by these clever corner pieces. And inside the Perspex case there is a plastic mold keeping the model into place, even though it's also tightly screwed onto the base. I really like the way this packaging style just fits nicely into one another, almost like Lego pieces. And it does offer good protection to the model and the display case as well. The base then is the same wooden grey one you get with all Spark models, even though sometimes the base is in black for some reason. On the base then is the model's info written on it. Underneath the base then there's a little pouch with the tobacco decals for the figurine. Although the box art is nothing special really, it does look good and it's slick enough to use for displaying purposes if you would want to. Before we move on, I'd like to say thanks already for watching the video. I hope you're enjoying it so far. And if you do, please leave a like and be sure to also subscribe to the channel if you like my content. It really helps me out and allows me to make more of these kind of videos. But okay, sorry to interrupt, let's continue the review. As usual, I examined the model from all angles as soon as it came out of the box, mainly to check if there weren't any flaws in it, but it seems quality control had a good day and nothing majorly wrong was noticeable really. There was the ever so slightest mark here in the headrest, but that was easily fixed afterwards. A few more pressing things did catch my eye though. The most noticeable one, well for me at least, is the color of the helmet. I think the top part is too light blue, it should be a few shades darker. In fact, on the real helmet, it's actually the same color as the upper band on the side. Here you can see there is a significant uh, difference in between the blues. Weirdly enough, the 143 scale version did not have this problem. Another thing Spark did right on the 143 scale, but messed up a bit on the 118th here, is the steering wheel, and it should actually be red instead of black. I find it strange they didn't pick up on that, especially considering they got it right on the earlier released 143 scales. Now to be fair, I only noticed this when I was already in the process of doing some other improvements on the model, so if you don't know the steering wheel should be red, then you would never notice it. Then there is also the lack of cuts in the front and the rear wing flaps. And this actually surprised me quite a bit, as Spark usually does feature these cuts, especially in the more recent releases. And these wings on the classic cars also don't have too complicated layouts, like on the front wing there's only one cut to be made. On the rear wing it's unfortunately even more noticeable. And here too it seems it wouldn't have been too complicated to make the cuts in between the planes. Finally then, I also think some branding is missing from the spokes on the wheels. It normally has these uh, extra decals on them, like on this Minichamps Williams FW16 for example. So there are a few issues that I noticed on this model car. Does this mean there are no good parts then? Well, no, and it's actually a pretty nice model I think. First there is the overall shape of the car, and it really looks like Spark has nailed this. The dimensions and proportions look right to me. I mean, they've done their homework in that regard. The small rivet detailing, for example, in the end plates on the front wing is a very nice touch. 
and these are also featured on the rear wing as well. I mean, they're just simple decals, but very necessary in my opinion. The body panel lines then look clear and visible, and you'll notice these shallow holes, let's say, representing the rivets in the panels. The fine antenna and pitot tube on the uh, top of the tub and the antenna on the left side pod look very refined, as does this small cockpit window. The NACA duct then and the red triangular piece here in front of the cockpit are also nice and were indeed present on the car at the Monaco Grand Prix of that season. These fine winglets on the side of the cockpit floor are a very nice little detail too. The side pod inlets also have a fine mesh in it, which is always better than just having a blacked out piece blocking it off. Some other small details that I like are the little hole here in the roll hoop, the gearbox casing underneath the rear wing beams with that uh, cherry red rear light on it. And if you look further down the inside of the car, let's say, you can spot some spring detailing. Underneath the car in the diffuser, the exhaust exits are also visible. The wheels then also look really nice. They're quite simple, but still are good with the OZ branding in the yellow rings in the rims. Just a shame about the missing extra branding decals. I also like that Spark doesn't perfectly align the tire branding anymore on the sidewalls. In between the spokes you can see the brake discs and calipers. The central locking wheel nut is nicely detailed and is the same color all around. Since this is a Spark resin model car, the wheels don't rotate nor is there any steering functionality on the model. The cockpit details then are pretty good on this model. The figurine looks really nice with a realistic looking helmet. I already talked about the color of the helmet, but the decals on it are actually very good and clear. The shape is realistic and the semi-transparent visor is a nice touch. It's crazy to see how much of the driver is actually exposed on these older models. I mean, the shoulders even stick out of the side of the cockpit. The driver's overalls are very nicely replicated as are the gloves. The tobacco branding is missing of course, but Spark have provided a decal set for you to add to the figurine yourself. The belt details are pretty nice with these photo etched buckle parts. The steering wheel then looks ok shape wise. Of course the color is wrong as I mentioned in the previous part, which is a bit of a shame. The gear stick lever is uh, visible too underneath the driver's right arm. And this bulge in the cockpit is actually there to allow for better movement of the gear stick, so it's only represented on the right side of the car. As usual, I wanted to make some changes to my model a bit in a few areas. I tried to improve the wheels by adding these extra markings to the tire sidewalls for a more realistic look. I then also added some aluminium tape to replicate the wheel weights. And then the missing OZ branding was added on the spokes of the wheels. On the bodywork then I improved the rivets by putting a small decal on them. And this makes the panels pop out a bit more I think. I then also added a little pull ring in the E decal here on the side of the engine cover. The tobacco decals that were provided with the model were added too on the helmet and also on the driver's overalls. To the helmet, I also added this uh, tear offs on the visor. Next to the driver's left arm, then the FIA and Lotus chassis tags were added to the inside of the cockpit. On the other side, the gear stick lever has been painted in this beige color, making it more visible then. The steering wheel has been painted red, with these buttons painted in red and turquoise. And finally then, a better dashboard ref counter has been added too. So now to conclude, I feel this is a decent model by Spark, but there were some noticeable mistakes. The flaws are certainly not something that will be a deterrent for most casual collectors, but it's annoying Spark didn't pick up on those, especially since they didn't make these mistakes on the earlier released 143 scale versions of the same car. It's certainly not terrible and the model still looks pretty good despite these issues and I'm sure Hakkinen fans would be very happy this model just exists. 
In short, I would say nice model, very cool subject, but if you're here for accuracy, then maybe a bit underwhelming. Still, I think it's a worthy addition to any collection. I'm very happy with mine, especially with some of the issues that I rectified myself. So now I would like to ask you what is your opinion of this model by Spark? Would the mistakes on it keep you from buying it or do you think the flaws aren't too noticeable anyways and that the overall good looks of the model can make up for it? Let me know in the comments down below. So that'll be it for the review then. Remember to like, subscribe and check out the other reviews on the channel as well. In the meantime, take care, see you soon and bye bye.